you. There was a, a woman taking an afternoon nap, and after she awoke, she said to her husband that I just had the most amazing dream. What did you dream? I dreamt that you gave me this beautiful pearl necklace for my birthday. And then with a smile, she says to her husband, so what do you think the dream means? The husband thinks for a moment and says, what does it mean? You'll find out tonight at your birthday dinner. You'll see tonight what the dream means. Sure enough, that night, the man came home with a gift wrap package under his arm and presented it to his wife with a candlelit dinner celebrating her birthday. She was delighted. She was excited. And with trembling hands, she unwrapped the package and she found inside a book entitled, The Meaning of Dreams. <laughs> the power of hope. <laughs> Before I begin, the subject of hope sounds easy. It's part of our vocabulary but it's difficult. Because it's easy to talk about hope when everything's going well. It's when we struggle that it becomes far more challenging. So I want to be clear before I begin that I, I, I don't like preaching. I'm not up here to stand and say, this is what you need to do and this is what you need to do. Rather, I write this talking to myself. It's the challenge that I face that I share with you. And it's what I feel that I need to strive to do that I share with you when we talk about the power of hope. So it's almost like a, a, a collective therapy session. I'd like to begin with two episodes from the book of Genesis. The first story recounts how Abraham was 100 years old, his wife Sarah was 90 years old, when they were blessed with a child who they named Yitzchak Isaac. That's one story in the Bible. There's another story, a second episode, that I'm going to focus on, and that is how Hagar, the maidservant of Abraham and Sarah, who had given birth to a son, to Abraham, whose name was Ishmael, was banished from their home due to the destructive effect Ishmael was having on Isaac. And Hagar was given water and provisions for her journey, but soon the Torah tells us she got lost in the desert. Their water supply was exhausted. The Torah tells us that Hagar left Ishmael under a tree and moved away from him saying that she could not bear to witness her son dying of thirst. She sat at a distance and she began to cry. A heavenly angel appears to her and assures her that God had not abandoned her. And the angel says this to Hagar, stand up. Lift up your child. Hold him in your arms. And then the Torah says, Vayifkach Elohim es eneha, God opened her eyes. And she saw a well nearby. She filled her canteen and she gave her son to drink and the boy survived. Those are the two stories I'm going to get back to later on. Let's talk a little bit about faith, about emuna. As I mentioned before, emuna faith is pretty easy when things are going well. It's part of the Jewish vocabulary. But emuna becomes a greater challenge when there's a crisis, when you're struggling when there is what we call tsaris. 
Even Maimonides, the Rambam himself, whose faith in God was unquestionable, he wrote the book on faith. He authored the 13 principles of faith, which tells us what to believe. He also wrote the guide to perplex, which tells us how to believe. And yet Maimonides himself writes about this deep depression that he fell into when his world was rocked. You see, Maimonides had a very close relationship with his brother David. In fact, for many years, Maimonides was supported by David, who was a successful diamond merchant. And this is what enabled Maimonides to devote himself entirely to the study of Torah and to his writings. One day, catastrophe struck, and David was traveling by ship, and the boat capsized, and his brother drowned by at sea with his entire fortune going down with him. Overnight, Maimonides not only became destitute, but he also knew how to provide for his brother's widow and their children. And dealing with the emotional loss of a brother that he was so close with. Maimonides was so broken. For years he couldn't get over the loss of his brother. I quote from his words, what could possibly bring me comfort? My dear brother grew up on my lap. He had a business and earned a livelihood for us both, and I could live without care. Whenever I see his handwriting or one of his books, my heart turns over and my grief is roused once again. It always gave me such joy to see him, and now my joy is gone. He has passed on to eternal life, leaving me shattered. Lule Torascha. God Almighty, he says, had your Torah not been my preoccupation, I would perish in my affliction. Note that Maimonides did not say that his faith and devotion to Torah prevented him from being sad. It didn't prevent him from being upset. It didn't prevent him from being shattered. But what it did prevent him was from becoming a defeatist and falling into despair. His faith gave him the strength to forge on despite the tremendous loss. He didn't sit all around, around all day licking his wounds and feeling sorry for himself. He recognized that circumstances had changed and that he would have to change now to adapt to a new set of circumstances. He understood that his sadness notwithstanding, God clearly had some new purpose in mind for him, and he needed to channel this experience. And somehow, despite the emotional pain, raise himself up and find a new path. So what did he do? He took up the study and practice of medicine in order to earn a living. And I think we all know the rest of the story. Maimonides went on to become one of the greatest physicians of his time, if not of all time, eventually becoming the doctor to the sultan himself. More than 800 years later, Maimonides' breakthroughs in the fields of science and medicine are still being invoked and celebrated all over the world. My friends, this is a very basic and fundamental principle of Judaism and of our Torah. Every situation, every difficult and adverse circumstance holds within it an opportunity for new growth and for achievement. Sometimes we get thrown for a loop. Sometimes we get caught off guard by things we never expected to happen. And that's when, to use some football analogy, you need to call an audible. Let me explain to some of you that don't know football what an audible is. You see, football is different than baseball. Baseball, you have 162 games a year. 162 games is a lot of games. How many games are there in football in a season? 16. 10%, that's it, 16 games. They play only once a week, and now they added that you get a week off in the middle of the 16 weeks. 
Why only once a week? Why not play every night? Well, if you've ever watched a football game, you probably know. They would die. <laughs> They're dying as it is. If they played every night, they would never survive. So are they off all week? Do they come to work Sunday and come back the next Sunday? No. There's a lot of chachma that goes into the game. There's a lot of wisdom in the game. All week long, they're in school. They have coaches. They're in workshops like this. And they have screens. And they're showing them clips of the other team that they're going to play next week. And if you move over here, this is what they're probably going to do. And this is what they're probably going to do. And they have binders with every possible type of play that should be called and will be called. Everything is pre-thought by these coaches. And all week long, that's what the players are busy doing. So you wait for an entire week. Your quarterback, who is the leader of the team, you get to the line of scrimmage. That's where they all line up and they put their heads down facing each other, right? And the quarterback, as we say in Yiddish, I get that cook. He gives a look. And he sees that the defense is lined up in something he's never seen before. With all of your week-long video clips of everything these guys ever did before, that he's never seen this. And he's clueless. What's he going to do now? They didn't prepare him for this. So the mediocre quarterbacks know that what they should do is simply fall on the ball. Let's not take a loss here. This play is not going to work. The great quarterbacks, and there are just a few of them, call what's called an audible. At the line of scrimmage, using code, they are calling out what you think, they're just calling out strange numbers and statements. They're actually talking to their players. And they're saying to the players, uh-oh, <laughs> it's not going to work. So instead of doing what we prepared all week to do, we're going to do something entirely different. And the quarterback on his own makes a determination, what's he going to do? And he sends this message to his players. He's thinking on the spot. He's got some 20 seconds to deliver this message to his teammates. The great quarterbacks, when they call that audible, that's when they become champions. That's when they can score a touchdown because no one's expecting it. Not his own players, not his coaches, not the other team. Why am I giving you a football lesson? Because sometimes in life we have to call an audible. We're not prepared. We're looking at what's in front of us and we say, no one prepared me for this. This is not what I expected. We all had dreams in life of what life was going to look like. Going through elementary school and high school, we had it all planned out, right? You can see what it was going to be like. You can see your successes. You can see your beautiful children. You can see the nachas. You see it all. And then life happens. And it's not what the video showed you. It's not the movies. It's not the TV shows. You're staring at real life, and you're lost. You can fall on the ball. You can simply say, I can't do this. And some of us do. And there are days that we do that. Or we can take that ball, and we can call an audible and say, then we're going to have to make some changes. There's a story they tell about world-class violinist Yitzchak Perlman. I want to preface the story by saying that I've told this story many times and I have no idea if it's true or not. <laughs> I went on Snopes.com, you know the website Snopes, which tells you if a story is true or not true, and Snopes says, we don't know if the story is true or not true. <laughs> so I just want to be honest with my audience to say, I don't know if the story is true or not true, but it's a good story. <laughs> so. He was given one of his concerts, and that night as the lights went down, he made his way to center stage, as he always does, which for him is no simple feat. You know, Perlman was stricken by polio as a child. He has braces on both legs. He walks with the aid of two crutches. He walks methodically until he reaches his chair. He sits down slowly, puts his crutches on the floor, undoes the clasps on his legs. He tucks one foot back and extends the other foot forward. 
He bends down and picks up his violin and puts it under his chin, nods to the conductor, and proceeds to play. And his audiences, his fans, are used to the rituals, and they sit quietly by as he makes his way across the stage, as he goes through this very long process of getting from the side of the stage to starting the concert. But by this particular show, something went wrong. Just as he finished his first few bars, one of the strings of the violin broke. And the audience can hear the snap, pow. It was like a gunshot. There was no mistake in what that sound meant and what he would now have to do. He would have to walk off stage, spend some time fixing the violin, putting on a new string, coming back and going through this same ritual again, which meant this is going to be a long delay. But he didn't do that. He waited a moment, he closed his eyes, and he then signaled the conductor to begin again. The orchestra began and he played from where he left off. And he played with such passion, with such power, with such purity, like they've never heard before. Now everyone knows that it's impossible to play a symphonic piece with just three strings. Everyone knows that, but that night, Yitzchak Perlman refused to know that. And you could see him modulating, changing, recomposing the piece in his head. And at one point, it sounded like he was retuning the strings to get new sounds from them that they had never made before. And when the show finished, there was this awesome silence in the room. And then the people rose and cheered. There was this extraordinary outburst of applause for what they just saw. People were on their feet, screaming and cheering, doing everything to show him how much they appreciated what they just witnessed. And he smiled, and he said, you know, sometimes, sometimes, it's the artist's task to find out how much music you can still make with what you have left. We all have to play our music in this world. At first, with everything we have. But then, even when some of it is lost, we still have to pay beautiful music. Maybe with three strings. With whatever we have left. And let's not minimize what we have left. I want to tell you about a school located in Brooklyn, New York. It's called HID, the Hebrew Institute for the Deaf. The school was founded in 1965 by a man named Rabbi Moshe Epstein. Rabbi Moshe Epstein's interest in providing Torah education for deaf children was triggered by the fact that two of his own sons were born deaf. So rather than cause and lament the fact that his babies were born without their hearing, Rabbi Epstein used it as a springboard to create an institution that over the years has enabled hundreds upon hundreds of deaf children to receive a Torah education. Someone once asked Rabbi Epstein what it was that gave him the strength and the motivation to transform his personal adversity into such a blessing, into such a mitzvah. And this is what he answered. He said, when I was a young boy, I was in a Soviet labor camp. This having, being after having escaped from a Nazi concentration camp. So he went from one, one to the next. Among my fellow prisoners was my Rebbe, who had taught me in Cheder years earlier. When the first Shabbat was approaching, we realized that if we refused to work, we would be killed on the spot. On the other hand, he didn't want to violate Shabbos. So as the sun was about to set on that Friday night, my Rebbe made sure to work, to pretend to be working alongside me. And suddenly, in a quiet voice, he began to sing L'chadodi. He sang it quietly, but every word so clearly. And I started singing along with him. The next morning, we continued with our Shabbos songs and prayers. My Rebbe knew all the prayers, and he knew the Torah readings by heart. And he repeated the entire Torah portion word for word as if he was reading it in the synagogue. 
Yeah, we would make believe we were working as much as just moving our fingers around. But even as we were doing what we were doing with our hands, we were sanctifying the holy Shabbos day with our lips, with our hearts, with our songs, and with our souls. And that's the way we celebrated every Shabbos until we were released. In that hellhole of a Soviet gulag, we created a Shabbos environment. Rabbi Epstein went on to say, it's been 50 years since, 50 years since those days. I have observed many Shabbosim in freedom, but I promise you that those Shabbosim in the labor camp with my Rebbe were the holiest and most beautiful of them all. Moreover, it taught me that there is virtually no situation from which it is not possible to build something beautiful and something holy. You know, I was first introduced to the study of Talmud in fifth grade. I was eight years old, as in most yeshivas, the first section of the Talmud that they teach us comes from the tractate of Baba Metzia, and they teach us the tractate, the chapter of Elu Metzios. Elu Metzios of Talmud discusses the laws of returning a lost object to its rightful owner. By Torah law, it's not this automatic finders, keepers, losers, weepers. There are laws, very complex and involved laws, about when you find an item, are you allowed to keep it, are you not allowed to keep it, how do you return it, how do you find the owner. One of the main concepts that come into play on this issue, and I'm going to use the Talmudic phrase and explain it, is called yiush. Yiush. What does yiush mean? The abandonment of hope. When a person loses an object, by Torah law, he still remains the legal owner of the item. It still belongs to him. He can be miles apart. It can be months apart. But he is still the owner of the item. And so if you find it, what you're holding on to is property that belongs to someone else. And you have an obligation by the Torah to find that person, to put up posters, to put ads in the newspapers, to put it on social media. Who lost an item? Because you need to get that property back to the individual. But there is an exception to this. If we can assume that the owner gave up hope of ever finding the item again, he experienced yiush, he gave up hope, it's never coming back to him, then that in itself severs the ownership. He is no longer the owner of the item. The mental capacity of simply thinking to yourself, I will never find this again, that in itself severs the relationship with the item. It's a very powerful concept. It's taught to us in the fifth grade, but it stays with us for the rest of our lives. Think of what's being said. As long as you have hope, you're still the owners of your destiny. You're still in the game. It's when you succumb to hopelessness and despair that the game is over. Hope is that powerful. During World War II, there was a family in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, whose son was sent off to fight in the European theater. One awful day, the family was notified that their son was missing in action. The parents were totally devastated. At that time, they belonged to Congregation Beis Yehuda, which was under the leadership of Rabbi Yaakov Tursky of blessed memory. Rabbi Tursky would visit with his family at least once a week to give them strength and encouragement. He would try to lift their spirits and he would say, missing in action doesn't mean killed in action. He could still be alive somewhere. He can be in a prison camp somewhere. The war will end. Maybe there'll be an exchange of prisoners of war. Don't give up hope. Don't give up hope. But the parents were so broken, so devastated. And he would have to come every single week to them to reiterate, don't give up hope. When the war came to an end, the family received this unbelievable telegram. Indeed, their son was alive. He had been held as a prisoner of war, and there was going to be an exchange of prisoners. What a joy. 
The soldier was relieved from his captivity and was first sent back to his base before returning back home. When he came to his base, he was given a stack of letters this high. It was waiting for him. Every single one of those letters was written by the same person, Rabbi Yaakov Yisrael Torsky of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. You see, every week, before Rabbi Torsky would visit this family to try to encourage them to have hope, he needed to have hope himself. And so what better way to build that hope than to sit down and write a letter to this soldier because he is alive. And if I believe he's alive because I'm writing him a letter, then when I go into the house to these broken parents, I can give some of that hope to them. King David writes, Kaveh el Hashem, hope to God. Chazak v'yameitz li be strong. Strengthen your heart, and then he concludes, and hope to God. So he begins with the words, hope to God, kaveh el Hashem, and he concludes with the words, kaveh el Hashem. Why the repetition? I think because King David knew it's not always easy to keep hope alive. Sometimes when you lose, you think you're lost forever. Sometimes when you're down, you think you could never get back up again. But it's exactly at that point that Chazak v'yameitz libecha, we have to find a way to strengthen our hearts so that we're able to hope. Several years back, there was a young man living in Israel. We'll give him a name. We'll call him Mati. Mati got himself in a heap of trouble. And rather than face his problems and deal with the situation, one fine day this guy picked himself up and he disappeared. He was obviously running from the law. He just disappeared, didn't say a word to his parents, to his siblings, to his friends. He couldn't handle the, that which he was facing and he skipped town. Rumor had it that he went to New York. But there was no proof, there was no trace, there was nothing to no whereabouts whatsoever. Months went by, then years. Mati's older sister, Shoshana, was gravely concerned. Her parents were in poor health. They wanted to see their son, but nobody had a clue as to where he was. Shoshana decided, I'll go to the United States. I'll go to this New York. I'll find him. He's got to be somewhere. Her friend said, Shoshana, New York is a big place. It's not like a little town, a little kibbutz. It's New York. America's a big tr country. You can't just go there and think you're going to find someone. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. But Shoshana missed her brother terribly, and she could no longer see the tears of her parents every single day, and so she went. She landed in New York, stayed by a friend's house, and realized that her friends in Israel were quite, quite right. It's a big city. Where do you look? Where do you go? So she made this flyer with a picture of Mati, and she starts going to places where she's told Israelis hang out, hanging up flyers. She visits every restaurant she possibly could. She's hanging up pictures wherever she can, week after week, putting up photos of her brother. Nothing. Nothing. After three weeks of this, she's feeling hopeless. And she makes plans to return home. She's dreading having to face her parents to say no clue of where Mati is. Before she was about to leave, the friend with whom she was staying had a connection to Chabad and said to Shoshana, you're here in New York anyway. You're leaving Sunday night. Sunday morning, go to Crown Heights. Go to the Lubavitcher Rebbe. He sees anyone that will come see him. He gives them a blessing. You have an opportunity to ask a blessing of the Lubavitcher Rebbe to find your brother. You've done everything else. Go. She says, what does she have to lose? So she takes a cab to Crown Heights. She waits online like everyone else, stretching for a long, long way. And she's getting closer and closer and closer 
to standing in front of the tzaddik, to stand in front of the holy person, to beg for a blessing, some clue, how can she find her brother? And then her moment came. She's standing face to face to the Rebbe. She looks at the Rebbe and she tries to speak, but no words could come out of her mouth. Tears begin to come down from her eyes. She wants to explain her situation, but her voice just shut down. No words. The Rebbe gave her an understanding and fatherly look. And the Rebbe said this line to her. It is forbidden. It is absolutely forbidden for a Jew to give up hope. It is forbidden, it is absolutely forbidden for a Jew to give up hope. She left the building completely shaken up. She couldn't stop crying. She didn't say a word to the Rebbe, but the Rebbe said what she needed to hear. Don't give up hope. Don't give in. She already had spent three weeks, but now she needed to extend this visit don't give up hope. It is absolutely forbidden to give up hope. She calls for the car service to take her back to the friend's house where she was staying. And she's crying the entire time. The cab driver, the car service driver, happens to be an Israeli, so she begins to speak to her. He speaks to her in Hebrew. What's wrong? Why are you crying? And she says, Mati, her brother, it gives the whole story, went to the Rebbe, it's forbidden to give up hope. And she tells this cab driver everything. She just pours out her heart. So the cab driver says, show me, show me the flyer, show me the flyer. And she takes out the flyer and she shows it to him. And she says, this is your brother? I share a basement with him in Queens. <laughs> Mati's your brother? And within an hour, brother and sister were reunited. And a few days later, son and parents are reunited. It is forbidden. It is absolutely forbidden for a Jew to give up hope. Rav Nachman of Breslov put it this way. Despair is not real. It's an illusion which has no true existence in reality. Feeling that your circumstances are hopeless is only a perception of your situation. It's not the reality of your situation. These are words, and I know it's just easy to hear words, and it's so much harder to put in practice. Put these words on a piece of paper, put it in front of you and read it to yourself every day. Make it part of your existence. Despair is an illusion. It's not the real circumstance of your life. So let's get back to the two stories I started with. Remember them? Story of Abraham and Sarah having a child. Story of Hagar. Who in their right mind would have thought that at the age of 100 and at the age of 90, respectively, Abraham and Sarah would still have a child? More so, why did God do it this way? In all biblical stories, I always ask that question, why did God do it this way? Why did he withhold a child from them until they so long passed their childbearing years? So it is explained that at the very genesis of our nation, God wanted to establish for the Jewish people as a founding principle that no matter what, no matter the odds, no matter what the writing on the wall may say, Jews don't give up hope. In the face of the greatest challenges and obstacles, we always have faith that the Almighty will find a way to pull us through. Keeping hope alive enables us to tap into the miraculous. But even more basic than that, it enables us to see things that otherwise we would not see. Which leads us to the second biblical story that I open with. Remember the story about the angel. The angel appears to Hagar in the desert. The angel tells Hagar, don't worry. The verse says, God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water nearby. 
Note there is no mention that a miracle took place. It doesn't say, and God magically made a well of water right near where she was. It says God opened her eyes and she saw the well. The well was always there. But because of her despair, she didn't see it. Open your eyes, the angel says. Look for the solutions because they're there. They're in front of you. Despair will blind you. Hope will open your eyes. The story of the Bible is telling us that we cannot give in to despair, that we have to always hold on to that hope. Just like Hugger, who couldn't see the thirst-quenching whale right in front of her eyes because of her panic and fear, which almost brought, brought the disaster that she dreaded, many of us do the same thing. We perceive the hopelessness of our situations as the reality and because of that, we make the wrong decisions because we're so buried in despair. I want to share a story that happened a few years ago with one of my fellow Chabad Shluchim. This was the emissary to Beijing, China, Rabbi Shimon Freundlich. He runs a very successful and busy Chabad house catering to the local Jewish population that come, many Jews come there for business. And he's a very friendly fellow. Anyone who stops by this Chabad house loves him because he's so welcoming, from the most religious to the most secular. Once while visiting New York, Rabbi Freinlich was invited to be a guest on Friday night Tish in Williamsburg by the Satmer Hasidim. And this was going to be a Tish with the big Rav from Williamsburg that was going to be there, and they invited Rabbi Freinlich to be their guest and to participate at this tish. Now, for some of you in this room, that in itself is miraculous. If you know a little bit of Hasidic history, you will know that for a period of time there was this rift between the Satmar Hasidim and the Bavacher Hasidim. The Satmar Hasidim did not appreciate our outreach to what they called the Freya Yidden, non-observant Jews, and they didn't appreciate our support for Eretz Yisrael. And for this, there was this, this friction that developed between the groups. But over the years, many Satmar Hasidim did a lot of business in China. And they would benefit greatly from Rabbi Freundlich's Chabad house. It was their place for Shabbos. It was their place to daven. And they really began to like him and respect him. And that opened the door for them to realize that their Chabad house is everywhere in the world. And you know, they're not so bad. And this outreach to the non-religious, it's not so bad. And many began to secretly at first admire Chabad, and then more recently publicly. So this invitation to a Chabad rabbi to share this tish was a big statement. So here they are, Rabbi Freinlach is sitting amongst many Satmar Hasidim. And the Rav calls over his Meshuras, his, his assistant, and he says to tell the Lubavitcher that he would like him to say a few words. That he wants him to speak. Now Mashiach is coming. <laughs> a Lubavitcher going to speak in a Satmar Shul. So Rabbi Freilich, who was not prepared for addressing the congregation, said, you know what, I'll, I'll share a story. A story that happened in our Chabad house not too long ago. As many of you here know, many people visit our Chabadas in Beijing every Shabbos, people from all walks of life. A Friday night, just two months ago, there was this older man, he was maybe about 80 years old, he didn't look very religious, he shows up at the Chabadas in the company of a younger fellow. The younger fellow was in his 40s, the old fellow was sitting in the very back of the shul, not really participating in anything. And suddenly you see he puts his face in his hands and he begins to cry. And he cried for about an hour, the entire prayer service. Every once in a while, he would wipe away his tears, and then the tears would come back again. So I went over to him quietly to ask if everything is okay, and he said, don't worry, don't worry. After prayers are over, everyone's invited from the shul to the dining hall. Everyone participates in a Friday night dinner. We have a tradition in our Chabad house that during the meal, we invite anyone that would like to say a few words to say a few words. And this elderly gentleman volunteered to speak, and this is what he said. My name is Samuel Katz. 
The reason I asked to speak is because, as many of you saw, I was very emotional before. And the reason I was so emotional is because the last time I was in a synagogue was over 60 years ago in Poland. I was a young man when the Germans came in. They took my entire city to Buchenwald. I was there for four years. And in those four years, I lost everything. My father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, my friends, all killed some of them before my very eyes. I survived. I got out at the end of the war, and after a few years of searching for family and friends with no results, I moved to Australia. I was totally alone. I was very angry at God. I succeeded at business, I made a lot of money. I got married, I had children, but my wounds and my anger were so deep that I resolved never to walk into a synagogue or to have anything to do with Judaism again, nothing. Then yesterday, I came to China with my friend, my business partner, and he says, for Friday night, we're gonna go to the Chabad house. So at first I said, no, I don't, I don't do synagogues. He said, forget about the synagogue part, dinner. We go there for dinner. Dinner is very good. I said, dinner I can handle. We get in. He says, just sit in the back. Just sit in the back. Dinner's going to start an hour. You're here anyway. Just sit in the back. And as soon as the chazan started singing the Chunaranana and the Chadoti, all of a sudden the memories came in. My father was right there. My Zaidi was right there. I was there. I was back in shul again. I was back to being a child again. And I began to cry. 60 years of tears that were bottled up. And I couldn't, I couldn't stop the cry. And this is what this fellow was saying to this Chabaras. Thank you for allowing me to come back home, to be back home. And Rabbi Freundlich is telling this story in Williamsburg. There's not a dry hot eye in the house, he tells them, as this man was speaking in Beijing. Everyone sitting at the tables were crying along with Samuel Katz. And at some point, a woman stood up and said, Mr. Katz, if you were in Buchenwald, perhaps you know my father. Because my father was also in Buchenwald. His name is Naftali Kogan. He also survived Buchenwald. Samuel Katz's jaw dropped. His eyes bolted open. He started yelling, Naftuli? Naftuli? Naftuli leapt? Naftali is still alive? He survived? There were three of us, myself, Naftuli, and one other. We were the closest friends. We were known as the three Kaihanim of Buchenwald. We would go around giving blessings to people because the Torah empowers the Kohen to bless. We risked our lives for each other and then we were separated and I never knew if he ever survived and I tried looking but I couldn't find. Tell me, is he alive still today? And she says, yes. And soon after Shabbat, Rabbi Freundlich is telling this audience in Williamsburg, we had Samuel Katz and Naftuli Kogan on the phone with one another. And they made up to get together and they were reunited after all these years. This is the story Rabbi Freundlich is telling over in Williamsburg. Rabbi Freundlich finishes his story and says how it was the most incredible reunion that he's ever been part of. And there's a commotion going on in the shul. And they see that there is one of the elderly fellows, the Rosh Hashiva of the yeshiva, is struggling to speak. He's struggling to speak. His face is pale, and he finally yells out, Zok Shmuel, un Zok Naftali as Yankel lept noch echid. Tell Shmuel and tell Naftali that Yankel, the third Kohen, is also still alive. It's me. The three of them in different parts of the world reunited again. My friends, the hope and the faith and the eternity of the Jewish people is an unshakable and unbreakable phenomenon. It's the most powerful truth of all. 
As the son of a Holocaust survivor, I can tell you that two groups of people emerged from that dreadful nightmare. One group was convinced that this was the end of Jewish peoplehood, that Yiddishkeit had come to a complete end, that there would never be such a thing again as an observant Jew, that the game was over, and nobody in their right mind has a right to judge anyone who went through what those people went through. But there was another group that emerged, <coughs> the group that never gave up hope, that never gave up their faith in the indestructibility of the Jewish people. They knew that they would rebuild the Jewish world that had just been destroyed, and they knew that the Jewish people would rise from the ashes. Someone once shared with me that he once went on a sightseeing tour of Europe and he found himself in Rome at the famous Arch of Titus. It was late at night and he stood there in the pouring rain staring at this imposing piece of architecture built in celebration of the ruthless tyrant who led the siege of Jerusalem and the charge of the Holy Temple. He looked up at the images carved in the ancient stone engravings hailing the heroism of the cold-blooded warriors showing Jews being led in chains, showing the vessels of the holy temple being taken away. This man was overcome by an awful wave of sadness. Standing in the shadow of those vulgar pillars, he could imagine the terror of his ancestors. And just as he felt that he could not contain his grief any longer, he looked up again and he noticed another engraving in the ancient stone. Apparently some Jewish vandal had worked up the audacity to deface the monument by inscribing three Hebrew words, Am Yisrael Chai. And suddenly his mood changed, and he yelled out in the darkness through the rain, You evil Titus, I want you to look closely, look at me. I'm still here. We're still here. The Jewish people are still here. And where are you? Where is the glorious empire you thought would rule the world forever? You see, a Jew never gives up hope because for a Jew, life is never hopeless. And we don't just mouth empty words of hope. We make it real. We feel it in our bones, in the very depths of our souls. Through the fire and through the hell, we still believe in tomorrow. We say it. We sing it. We live it. I once saw a poster that showed a flock of birds in flight and the caption under it read, they fly because they think they can. There's so much we can accomplish physically and spiritually if we don't despair of our capacity to go out there and do it. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Adjust to the situation. If you only have three strings left on the violin, do a bit of remodulating, but go out there and make some music. Kaveh al Hashem, chazak v'yameitz libecha, v'kaveh al Hashem. Hope to God. Be strong. Strengthen your heart, and hope to God. And remember that nobody, nobody, but nobody can ever take hope from us, unless we, God forbid, surrender it voluntarily. I'd like to conclude with one final story. Back in the day, there was this simple Jew. He wasn't very learned, he wasn't very educated. He kept the basic traditions such as kosher and Shabbos and holiday meals, but attending synagogue was not one of his priorities. And one year he decided he was gonna go to shul on Rosh Hashanah. He entered the shul services, the services were already on the way, he took a seat in the very back of the shul. Hours passed and this thing just kept on going and going and going, like wow, and he's getting hungry. And the hunger begins to intensify, and the cantor continues to sing away. And at some point, the cantor entered into some very serious, long-going thing, and the people in the room started crying. So he's thinking, well, what are they crying about? And he realizes, I know why they're crying. They're just as hungry as me. <laughs> they're starving, and they can't wait for this guy to stop singing so they can go home and eat. So he starts crying along with them. He's getting into it. I can relate to that. Then the cantor switches the melodies to something lively, and everyone starts clapping along. What are they so happy about? It dawned on him. He knows his wife put up a stew, a chalent, 
And he knows that chalent tastes a lot better if it's on the stove for a very long time. So he realizes the reason they're clapping is because they too realize, although we're here a long time and although we're very hungry, the chalent is going to taste so good when we finally get home. So he's clapping along with them. But then the cantor changes and gets into the serious tone again, and they begin to cry again. What now? Ah, he realizes. Even though the chalent is going to taste so good, the fact remains, we're starving, and we want to eat. This, my friends, is Jewish history. It's one big chalent. <laughs> you see... We know that there's very good reasons for the exile, why things have been cooking and brewing for such a long time. We have perfect faith that it's for a higher purpose, and the longer it goes on, the more sumptuous and glorious the end celebration will be. And so indeed, we will continue to forge on through all the challenges and continue to go through it, never losing hope, never losing faith. But there comes a point where every Jew must cry out from the depths of their being, enough already. The Cholent has been cooking long enough. We want to go home. All of the purposes and explanations and philosophies are fine, but the fact remains we're hungry. It's time to end the exile. It's time for redemption. And so I close with a prayer. And although you don't have the words of this prayer in front of you, because I wrote it myself, <laughs> I want you to, to join me. Join me emotionally, mentally, but more importantly, spiritually. In this prayer to God. Father in heaven, Tate in Himmel, compassionate Father, your people have gone through a long, difficult history and have faced adversity the likes of which no nation has ever seen. And yet they have survived with their dignity, with their faith, with their hope, with their trust in you, dear God, intact. Dear God, in this room today, each of us knows someone who is hurting. Perhaps it is we ourselves. There is real pain. We have loved ones that need a refuah shalema, a complete and speedy healing. We have breadwinners that need parnasa, a livelihood for their family. We have parents that want and deserve to see nachas from their children. We have women and mothers who long to have children. We have lonely people looking for a shidduch for a suitable match. We have day-to-day -day struggles in life which are too many to enumerate. And no, we won't abandon you. We won't lose faith in you. We won't stop hoping and praying for a better tomorrow. We will overcome our difficulties. We will forge on and we will persevere. But dear God, with all due respect, love and awe, can't you find a sweeter way? You are infinite. You are God. Surely you can. We say in our prayers, Avinu Malkenu, you are our king, but you are also our loving father. I know my father can't handle seeing me in pain. And so I beseech you, dear God, be our father. Tata, Tata, enough, enough pain, enough tsaras. We yearn for your embrace, for your closeness for your healing, for your kindness, and for your love. May Mashiach come speedily in our days. Amen.